Cashflow Diary Podcast, Episode 410. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. The podcast that teaches you insider tips, tactics, and strategies for creating leverage streams of cash flow into your life. Learn from top performing entrepreneurs, business owners, investors, and thought leaders from across the globe as they share their secrets to success. Like what you learn on this and other Cash Flow Diary podcast episodes? Go to learninvestingnow.com and sign up to receive powerful tips and information that will help you succeed as an entrepreneur and investor. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, educator, speaker, author, and master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow game, Jay Massey. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Massey, and I'm glad that you're here today because here's what I know about you. I know that you desire to build your cash flow. I know you desire to do it fast. I know you desire to do it partially because I'm going to go out on a limb and say that you want total control over your finances. Now, What do I mean by all of these things? I mean, you've been down the road, you've taken the blue pill, and you want the other one now, and I think today's guest is going to be able to introduce some concepts to some of you that will help you do exactly that. Well, what are you talking about, Jay? Well, I'm talking about Damian Lupo, and you're like, who's that? Well, that's exactly why you're going to listen, because you're going to want to take copious notes as I tell you that what if everything you thought was true actually wasn't? And more importantly than that, what if it hadn't been that way since, I don't know, 1974, maybe even 1971 or further? And more importantly than all of that, what if listening to this entire episode set you free and put you on a course to where you could finally make those dreams happen? And I think that's what's going to happen for you today because, see, Damien, he's an entrepreneur at heart. First business at the age of 11 and started 30, that's right, three zero more cents. He's founded his own martial art, Yokido, for those of you who are wondering. Holder of three black belts. But here's what's interesting and fun. He paid for his first rental house with a Visa card, has bought 150 houses in seven states over the next five years, and then went through a $20 million meltdown back in 08. Why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because not only are we talking to someone who knows his stuff, but he's been there. He's got the scars to prove it because today he runs an Austin-based fintech dedicated to disrupting Wall Street by getting people off the Wall Street roller coaster and in control of their money and financial future. That's why exactly you need to listen to none other than Damian Lupo. Damian, you here? I am, Jay. It's great to be here, man. Thanks for having me. I'm kind of glad that you're here, too, because um, I, I made a big promise that you're going to set some people free. You don't feel any pressure, do you? No, nah, man. We're going to break them off the, the roller coaster and, and cut the shackles. So let's do it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so this being your first time here, I tend to ask everybody the same question the first time that they're here. Are you ready? Let's do it. All right. I tend to look at today's entrepreneurs a lot like yesterday's superheroes, you know, Batman, Wonder Woman, Robin, etc. And I think entrepreneurs and superheroes have a ton of things in common. Chief among them, occasionally as an entrepreneur, we can envision ourselves as, I don't know, flying around the the world and saving our customers with our products and services, etc. And occasionally, you know, maybe we dress up with capes and types just for fun. However, also like a superhero, an entrepreneur has a beginning. And if you think, you know, like Spider-Man, for example, There was a time where he was just a kid going to school, trying to make ends meet, taking some photos for the newspaper. And then one day he gets bit by a spider. And then all of a sudden he realizes, ooh, I have a special ability. I get to use it for good or evil. And then he goes out into the world and we know the story. So my question to you is as follows. Before, you know, all of the the books that you've written, before, you know, buying houses, before your current company, Total Control Financial, before... Even Yokido. Before all that, what we want to know is, who is Damien Lupo? Gosh, be, before I was me today, who was I? I? I was thinking the first thing that came to mind was that I was a flying a flying squirrel, and that would be my superhero <laughs> power because I was chasing everything in sight, any shiny object I was out there running around after. And I think that's a lot of the entrepreneurs today. 
But what what I also realized when I look back is that I was I, I had no idea that something wasn't possible. And when I say something, I mean mm. anything. And I, the forward in my, my very first book was written with my old chairman saying, Damien literally came to me in Scotland and said, uh, I'm going to build the Great Wall of China. And he he believed he could. And that was my mindset back then. It was that anything is possible. And I was naive enough, which is really valuable when you're in your early 20s, that you think anything's possible. And there's nobody can tell you that something can't happen. And that was that was my mentality where I was going out and doing whatever I could dream up. And I didn't realize that you could actually get hurt or that things might not work. And I really didn't care. And the risk didn't really even seem to be part of the the formula or the or the calculation. And so I was just out there trying things. And so I was doing things that were really not very traditional or very common or they definitely were not supported by family and friends. They thought I was crazy. Mm. And so what I was, I was a disruptor in the norm. And I was I was somebody that was willing to go and and shoot for my dreams and not care as much about what people thought, or at least I was willing to act in spite of what they thought and what they said to me. Yeah, totally. I totally can relate <laughs> to a number of those things. But you said something that I think a number of entrepreneurs are going to want to make sure that you know, they, that they understand, at least I want to make sure they understand it, because you said that you were naive enough to to actually go and make sure that even though you had no idea that something was not possible, explain that a little bit more, because I think there's a number of people listening who might actually be in that state of mind right now, not saying it's bad, but for those who aren't, what does that feel like? What was that? What does that mean? What did you do that would you that's different than what, how you possibly act today well it, it's, it's actually a little bit annoying that, that now here i am 20 years later mm -hmm. and i'll look at opportunities after you know after i did all these real estate deals and things and i look at, at opportunities in business or real estate and i and i can feel myself going oh that that maybe that's a bad idea or that can't possibly work and what i'm realizing is that there's there's all this brain damage from personal experiences and what i've heard other people say that is blocking me from seeing what's possible so i shut down and this is the beauty of being naive when you're in your early 20s or your teens. You don't you feel like you're invincible and you don't look at something and think that it's crazy. Like when I did my I think it was my third house and I had a guy instead of giving me two thousand dollars down that I was asking, he gave me twenty five thousand dollars as a down payment it, with this lease option I was doing. And what I realized is you can literally create money out of thin air, just like the Federal Reserve does. I created as much money almost net in my hand that my parents made in an entire year net in their hands. And it was in a matter of probably six hours of work. It totally disrupted any idea of time for money. And that was something that would be really hard for a 40 or 50 year old that had been working for X number of dollars an hour to think, oh, I can just make something up and have somebody write me a check and I can create wealth in my mind. That's the value of being naive. It's that you don't have these limits that years of experience and brain damage will impose on you. And, you know, that that experience totally warps you. It disassociates the, the you know, the why does it take so long to earn money? I mean, all of those things are, are, are things that I think uh, are an advantage or can be an advantage. Uh, but you also speak of, well, brain damage, I believe is what you called it. And so I expound for us a, a little bit. What is, what were some of those things that have transpired that now make you possibly a little bit more hesitant? Well, I'll tell you one of the most powerful influences is the, is the voices in your head. And these voices in your head tend to start with voices outside of your head. And so I had a lot of voices back in, in the late 90s when I was starting in, in real estate where I was listening to people that were madly successful. And these were people that I didn't know. They were people on tapes and books because all the people that I knew physically were a lot like me in terms of they had the same level of wealth and they were going to college like I was at the time. And I wanted something different. So I started absorbing all these other voices and that became my norm. And so I went out there and I was like, well, this guy said I can make a million dollars a second if I want to. So that's what I'm going to do. And it just became real and, and normalized. And when I went into I, I melted down and I went into this fear space in 2008 after building up this giant portfolio, I started spending more and more time with people that were afraid that were saying everything is bad and it's and it can't possibly be that things are good or they will be again. And so I started to become that, too. And so I think that there's a choice that we make with the influencers in our lives, and it could be voices on a podcast or it could be the people around us. But if we're not conscious to that, 
we're going to become something that maybe is not exactly what holds our potential is, and it's maybe not something that we really want. So it is a choice, and that's that's the shift I've made. I don't spend time with those voices or those people anymore. I'm very particular about the influences because I know I'm going to become them. Yeah, I, I totally get that. One of the most important things an entrepreneur has to protect is his or her confidence, and you lose that, it can take some time to to get that back. Now, you you mentioned a a meltdown. Um, I, I think there's a lot to talk about right there because you know when you're going through a state of I can never fail, and then you go through a state of, oh, failure is possible even for me. You you learn a few things. What would you say were some of the you know top three or best lessons that came from that? First one, and this is this is something that took me several years to even get past, was that losing money or losing something, a business or whatever you're doing, does not equate to you being. Uh, you being worthless. So when I lost my my five million dollar net worth and it went to negative five million, I had so closely tied my personal value, my my self worth, with that net worth that I started challenging that my reason for existence. And it was a really really dangerous time and a dangerous mm-hmm. space. And a lot of people do that where they're so wound up with what they're doing. And if it if it fails, and I I really don't think that things fail. I think we just have opportunities to learn. Because And especially us as individuals, we're not a failure unless we don't learn. That to me is a failure. It's not that your thing didn't work. That's that's an opportunity. That's the universe giving you a chance to grow. And and I really spent a few years not getting that until it finally popped that I wasn't my, my balance sheet. There was something more, something deeper, more, more important to share. There, So all three of those lessons were one lesson. It was the most powerful thing that freed me to be able to move forward and not worry about whether or not it fell on my face. I mean, I've, I've made mistakes. I, I, one of my mistakes not too long ago, I, I committed a year with a lot of time in investing in somebody else's project because I thought it was a good synergy and it was a mistake and it was hundreds of hours of my time and my team and a lot of money and I own it and I made a mistake and I move on. If I became that mistake, I'd be paralyzed and stuck. And that's the dangerous space for us to not be able to move forward after we learn from something. Well, what I find very powerful about what you just said, which I hope a number of people are listening and, 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 and catch, is you said, I made a mistake. I own it. And a, oftentimes when we find ourselves in, <laughs> in an, uh, an unplanned, we'll call it an unplanned outcome, <laughs> we can wa- have the desire to say something like, well, they caused this mistake or this happened because of someone else where did the courage come from for you to own it well it it came from me spending a lot of years not owning it after 2008 i had a lot of those same they it it was it was not me it was it was the economy it was the banks it was whatever that did this and my partner was a scumbag and it was like all that stuff and i remember when when i got fired from a volunteer position in 2010 I was still not willing to own that it was me that I did this, and I was I was pushing back online and, and telling people that I had I had resigned. I didn't resign. I got fired. It, the moment I decided that I was looking in the mirror and I was looking at a liar, I said, "This is not the guy that I want to look at anymore," and, and something's got to change. And so I I said, I, "I'm going to own things," and it's one of the reasons that out of my top six values for myself and my company, the number one is self responsibility. It is a it's a uh, a filter for me on my decisions. It's a filter for who gets close to me in my life. It's a filter, I think, for people that you can trust. If somebody is willing to say, I did all these things that didn't work and they're willing to give credit and be humble about things that did work for other people that that influence things. Or if you start to hear those words from people, you really know who you're dealing with. So you'll never hear me blaming anybody for anything. It doesn't matter. It, it Whatever happened, it was me. And that's because I can do something with it. And when we take responsibility, we no longer lose control. We have the ability to shift anything in our lives, no matter what it is. Yeah. And and I think uh, I, I'm going to say that that's, that's probably what I would normally call that that superhero moment here in, in, inside of your story is, you know, that superhero moment is where you finally come to some realization. And, you know, Peter Parker gets bit by a spider. You just w- waking up to, hey, that. The story's not over. In fact, it's just beginning, and I've got something that I can still share. So what was that uh, transition, recovery, or as you would say, reinvention look like? Hey, guys. Thanks for listening as always, and I'm glad that you continue to support with each and every download and subscription and share 
One of the things that I want to ask you, though, is where are you listening to me from right now? I know some of you, maybe you're on a treadmill, maybe you're washing dishes, maybe you're walking that dog, and some of you are actually in a vehicle driving right now. One of the fun things that you can do, get some of your time back, is begin to living a car-free existence. But even then, it can be a little complicated. So one of the things that I want you to do is I want you to go over to Zipcar. Go to joinzipcar.com forward slash cash flow diary. It's a way that I am able to still go get a car just for a few hours very, very simply so that if I have a lot of errands to run and sheets to drop off and running to the short term rentals or if I just want to go for a long trip up to L.A. and back, etc., I can rent a car for a very, very short period of time. And the cool part is I don't even have to pay for any gas. Again, go to joinzipcar.com forward slash cash flow diary. It was, it was the first thing that I, I really remember doing when I was lost and I was, I was shifting into a space of something else. I didn't, I didn't want to repeat the past because if we don't really, if we don't exchange our mind, if we just change our mind and we say, I'm going to do something different, if we don't really fundamentally shift our spirit, something deep inside, we're going to have a, a very similar experience from our past. And I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know how to exchange my mind. So I went and asked for help. And I spent a couple of years working with a guy uh, in, in Austin and asking the questions of who I was and really going deep. And that that was the work that that is rare that most people won't do because it hurts, it's expensive, it's time consuming. And what happens is you evolve into a different space that you can be proud of and you can let go of your past, but you got to be willing to invest in that person that you're going to become. And that was what I did. I decided that was more important than anything else. And so I went deep for a couple of years. That was the transition. That was the reinvention. Got it. Totally understood. Now, take us, if you will, through this journey. How do we get to to the current version of Damien that we are, are, are talking to today? Where does Total Control Financial come from? It comes from a, a really a, a disrupted me where I, <laughs> I, I <laughs> you disrupt yourself. I love it. This is I'm great. a disruptor, man. I start with myself and right there. And it was a few years ago. Uh, my my dad got really sick, and and I was I, I went up to Alaska and I was spending some time with him, and he it, like sick, like he was stage four cancer, and and we were talking, and mm. and I remember sitting down. I, like the last conversation we had at a, at a coffee shop. And I was, I was just telling him how, how grateful I was that, that he stuck around, that he was in my life, that, you know, the, the lessons that the pain he had caused me and the growth he had inspired. And he looked at me and he just, he was tearing up and he said, man, I, I had so many things that I wanted to do. Mm. And I, I went, Oh man, that is literally the most heartbreaking thing I've ever heard because I just felt and saw regret. And, and I went that, is not going to be me and I'm going to figure out how to help people not be that in that space of regret. And so something shifted and I started asking the question, how can I be a bigger teacher? How can I live full out? How can I impact people? How can it be more than just more for me? And, and that's where things started to evolve, where I was asking, how can I teach and influence and impact more people? It's not about another million dollars in the bank. It's about another million people that have lifted up and ri- risen and maybe had a little bit more confidence in their life because of something that I've pushed to teach them or to inspire them with. That's the difference. That's who I am now. And that's what the mission of the company and my life is all about. It's it's the impact on people and freeing them and redefining how they see financial freedom and freedom in general, and then giving them tools and ideas and inspiration from the front that they can follow and then create their own lives with. Totally understood. Uh, I can relate to that. Now, What's interesting to me, though, is that it it seeks expression in a completely what seems to be un, unorthodox fashion. So help us understand exactly what Total Control Financial does, because when hearing what you just said, it doesn't seem like it lines up. Yeah, it's it when it's it's also strange to me a little bit when I think about the things that are really important to me, like the the training that I've done with martial arts over the years. I've I've taught for the last twenty years. And and those how that gets wrapped into finance and it gets wrapped into this space of, <laughs> of teaching and they all work together. And the, the reason that the, the total control financial is is where I'm, I've landed, it's because there's there's really there's three things in our life that matter to us the most. It's it's money, it's our health and it's sex. I mean, these these three things we, we just we go crazy in that order. For. I, I'm not really sure. It depends <laughs> on the person, probably. Right. <laughs> 
<laughs> just checking, just checking. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know. It's everybody has their priorities. I, I, I know that those impact us, and we pay attention. And with finance, if we don't have that correct, if we don't have it figured out to some degree, if we don't have freedom around our financial lives, it tends to be like shackles. And this has everything to do with people not knowing what is happening with their money and not being in control of that money for their future. And so there's this anxiety that we're going to run out of our money before we run out of life, typically because people put all their money into somebody else's hands and they say, I hope it works out when I sit when I'm 60 years old. I hope it works out. They smoke a whole bunch of hopium and then they wake up at 60 (laughs) and they go, damn, it didn't work out very well. And I'm broke. This sucks. And there's a different path. And that's what Total Control Financial is all about, giving people an alternative so that they can take their money out of that Wall Street system, out of that handoff, and really start driving their own vehicle and making the choices that are going to give them the freedom to choose how their life is going to look instead of just hoping it all works out. I just want to make sure I heard that correct. You said hopium, right? Yeah, man, you got you got to stop smoking the hope, man. Like, you know, take it out of your mouth. <laughs> hope is not a viable strategy, people. I think that's what he's saying. So, uh, what specifically do you mean when you, you're going to take away and give more control? How, how does that work? Well, it, it starts with understanding that when when we're we're thinking about investments and we're thinking about retirement, which is a whole other thing, because I happen to think that retirement is the stupidest possible thing anybody could ever focus on. But if if we're just talking about our later years, it there's an there's an idea that you're you're too stupid to make your own choices, that you're it's too complex for you to be able to make the right choices and and, and be successful. And so we hand off money to brokers and and the Wall Street system, and and then we let go, and then we kind of abdicate responsibility. And in my mind, there's a completely different world. And this is based on my experience of of building assets and having zero dollars, like negative zero, negative money and buying a, a rental house on a Visa card, knowing that we can create wealth in our mind and then we can express it externally. And, and we can do that if we're willing to say, I'm not going to just hand off my money and my control. I'm going to I'm going to take that money and I'm going to start doing things that I'm in control of that I can influence and not get feed to death by something that that is really <laughs> out for itself and not me. And so that's what we start doing, giving people tools to move their money from the Wall Street stuff, taking it away from their 401k mutual funds and saying, you can start investing in things that make sense to you that you can influence. And then they start going out there and creating and building the confidence. And therein lies true freedom. It's the confidence. It's not the cash and it's not necessarily even the cash flow. It's the confidence that they can create. Excellent. And and creativity is definitely one of those things that well, is in it's empowering to say the least, because what it comes down to is when you feel like you you can start with, we'll say zero or less than zero and and recover from that, then there's not much else that can feel like an obstacle, right? That's it, Jay. When when we're we're talking about being able to survive, because really it comes down to this like reptilian brain where mm-hmm. we're we're trying to make sure that we don't get killed. We we like we want to procreate, which is where the sex comes in, and we we want to <laughs> actually survive, which is where the money and the health comes in. So these things are really based on something that's been in our brains and, and hardwired for thousands of years. And if we've got the confidence and we know that we can go do and create that financial piece anytime we want. We're not wondering, okay, do we have to wait for the the next animal to come by to hunt that thing? We just go, okay, I know what the formula is, and I believe in myself. And that's the thing. If we've done something, we can we can reference the actual experience. And so that's why it's so important to start experiencing things. Even if you trip and stumble a little bit, you're going to start to build the muscle and the legs to continue to go do that and get stronger and stronger. That's what people have to get, that it's not about having the perfect execution. It's about having something falling off the bike and getting back on. I mean, really, it it had do anything, but don't just sit there and think about it. You've got to go do it. But Damien, you're talking about failure. Failure is not fun. That's not what I was taught in school. I mean, I was supposed to get it right the first time. I can't get help. Help me, man. Yeah, help. You know what? I'll tell you what would would be good for that whole system. Opt out. (laughs) Like get say say no, thank you. Because our system is completely setting people up to to screw themselves with this idea that failure is bad. Failure is how we learn, and yet our system says 100% is perfect. I was a straight A student for a long time. I had all A's and and I got the accolades, and it's because I was really good at memorizing stuff. But it didn't mean that I was actually absorbing things that I could go use. And what I wish is that the system was more was harder on me and pushed me to actually fail because that's where we learn so much. Yeah, indeed. So with that being said, um, I, I could interpret what you're saying that in in order for me to be successful at taking 
control, as you're talking about, uh, I must also therefore become good at learning how to fail. That's it. It's a, I think it's a John Maxwell book, uh, Failing Forward, or, or maybe it's Brian Tracy. I'm not sure, but there's it's really you're using your failures to keep pushing you forward and you, you start to pop to different levels of of belief in yourself and confidence and skills. And you're not going to do that by memorizing a bunch of formulas in some book about anything. It's just not how it works. You don't become something super powerful. You don't get your superhero powers if you read about them. You've got to go. You got to go to the gym. You got to go to the life gym and like get stuff done and watch yourself sweat and bleed. Oh, dude. Okay, I'm just going to ask you to say that again because somebody was like washing dishes or their dog barked and they weren't paying attention because that that was gold right there. <laughs> Look, if if you're if you think that you can actually become something different from who you are today by reading it in a book without going out into the streets, into the trenches and bleed and sweat and struggle, you're out of your mind. That's where it's at. That's where the people we look up to have spent their lives. It's in the trenches. It's in the streets. It's in the unknown. It's out in the woods. And they're on a hero's journey. We all have one of these things waiting for us. Mm -hmm. If we're willing to have the, the belief and trust in ourselves to walk forward into the darkness, we can totally make this happen. But we've got to be able to take that step. And that just requires a choice. It requires us believing a little bit in ourselves. Indeed, indeed. But Damien, okay, Total Control Financial works in a space where let's just say that you have a <laughs> a few competitors, a few other people, a few you have an entire industry that that spends billions of dollars every year telling people that they that that they have to be dependent, that they they can't take control, they can't do these things. And I know you get many questions like, is this legal? How on earth can this be? How come I haven't heard of these things? So could you explain a little bit clearly exactly what the, the, the benefit of, you know, total control financial, but and more importantly, why many of the people listening may not even know that, you know, something like what you guys have available even exists? Jay, there is a roller coaster people go on when they hear about about what we do and when, when we start talking about the QRP and, and the the whole tool that we're talking about, the vehicle, it, they go on this roller coaster and the first thing they experience is this total disbelief. Like, what are you talking about? Why don't I know if I, it, you know, if this was real, I would have heard about it. <laughs> and the reason and you haven't heard about it is because the Wall Street firms, the vanguards and the fidelities, they spend billions to keep you trapped in their system so they can fee you forever. That is why you don't know about this. When you decide you go to phase two where you go, wow, now I'm really ticked off. I didn't know about this 10 years ago. When you get into that phase, then you start thinking, okay, you know what? I'm going to move into something. I'm going to have control of it. And I'm annoyed, but I'm getting, I'm, I'm kind of excited. And you're going to move into a place where you're not going to be paying those fees ever again. Again, this is why that system doesn't tell you, hey, go out and manage your own money. Go do your own investments. You're smart enough. I believe in people. I, it's funny, I'm, I have really awkward conversations in politics and in business because there are a lot of people that think that the smartest people should run stuff, like on in Washington, D.C. or New York. I don't believe that. I think that you're smart enough and everybody that's listening is smart enough to be able to make their own choices and you don't need somebody telling you what to do with your own money. I think you have teams that help support you, but I don't think you need to hand it off because you're too stupid. And once you believe that, you're going to move into the final phase where you're going to take control. And then you're going to have this big smile because even when you're tripping on yourself, sometimes you're going to realize, hey, I got this. This is me and I can take this wherever I want it to go. So with with that, give us some examples of, of things that people have done when they've taken control. The most common popular things that people are doing and it's stuff that I do myself, they're they're buying real estate, they're buying rental property, they're buying land, they're investing in precious metals, things like gold and silver that they hold in their hand, not like the paper stuff that their <laughs> Wall Street's pitching, but like real stuff. They're they're investing in businesses that are that they can see the the dry cleaner down the street. They're actually able to invest in private companies. They're able to start their own companies and and use their money from their retirement funds to to invest in those things. You can loan money to people that are maybe doing a startup or they're doing a real estate project so you can be the bank. I mean, there's all these things you can do, basically anything under the sun minus about a dozen things like you can't invest in rugs or or wine, probably because you drink the wine. But <laughs> you, you really, it's it's your own mind how creative you can be and all these things that, that maybe you wanted to do, but you didn't really think you had the cash or the ability financially to invest in them. All of a sudden you can tap into the real estate or into the into the cash totally understood totally understood so let me ask this um 
have you seen anyone invest in Bitcoin? I'm just curious because I've not asked anybody. Absolutely. People yeah. are totally using it. Yeah, they're using they're using their QRP, their retirement funds. So like these are this is oftentimes tax deferred money to invest in the in the Bitcoin and the alternative currencies. It's it's pretty awesome because I guarantee you that no Wall Street firm is going to say, yeah, I've got this mutual <laughs> fund of, of Bitcoin. There, in no way you can do that here. Right, right, right. Totally, totally. What's one of the strangest things you've seen? Like strangest, like someone takes their retirement plan and you're like, really? You want to do? OK. I had I don't know if this was strange or a little stupid. And it and it just because it, it actually may have worked out, but I still think it was stupid. I, one of um a gal I knew decided that she wanted to take her money and her retirement money and she wanted to invest in her neighbor's restaurant because they had good cannolis. And I went, okay. what kind of investment strategy is that? She's like, well, they're really good cannolis. And I said, I like cannolis too, but I'm not going to put $50,000 into cannolis. I mean, that's a lot of dang cannolis. So right. I, I, I think that that's important for people to to not get emotionally charged about some of the stuff and have some type of rational brain kicking in at some point C- could save you from yourself. Indeed. So... Did, did you at least get to go to the restaurant and try one of these cannolis to help reduce some due diligence? <laughs> I, you know, I, I didn't go to that restaurant. And the reason I think I thought it was so crazy, because years ago, I, I started building a restaurant. So I was investing and I thought it'd be really fun to be the bartender and to meet all these people. And so I dropped hundreds of thousands of dollars into this restaurant. And my timing couldn't have been worse because I started doing this in 2008 awesome. and was halfway built and the meltdown happened in the markets and the entire project collapsed. And it was, and you know why I did this? You know why I was in a restaurant here? Because the lady that was my partner had a restaurant before and I loved the muffins she used to make. And I thought, I'm going to be in business with the muffin maker. <laughs> well, that's not too far from cannolis, but I, I okay, I get, I get the idea. I get, I get the understanding now. So you're like, you, you don't know. Yes. Got it. Wisdom <laughs> uh, now prevails. Um, no muffins, people, no cannolis, or at least to do a lot more diligence than just that. So it, here's the question then. There's a number of people who I know are listening and that they've been told you know obviously raised in one system hey this is what you do with your retirement plan this is where it goes um and there was something that you said earlier that i i want to highlight you you have a different view of retirement i believe than what most people may have grown up with would you share that yeah i will i and this this actually hit home really hard with me when when i was probably Eh, 10 or 11 years old, about the time I started my video game business, I was listening to my dad, who was really frustrated at the time. Uh, actually, he was always frustrated. He'd come home just irritated. And I said, why don't you just quit? And he said, I only have 12 years left until retirement. And I looked at him and I went, what? That doesn't make any sense. And it's this mentality that if we just do something long enough, then we'll be free because we'll have our time. And typically what we're doing is we're, we're exchanging the best years of our life where we're the healthiest and we're, we're the most open-minded and we're giving those away for some type of pseudo security or some type of, it's a, it's BS is what it is. And, and so we get to that point where we quote unquote are retired Mm. and we've got this pile of cash. If we're lucky, we have a pile of cash. And then my experience, and I had this, I've had this with a number of people I've worked with. They end up coming to me and they say, okay, I've got it. I've got $2 million in the bank and I'm 55 years old and I'm scared to death. And I said, why? Right. And I said, because I don't know if I'm going to lose it. And I, if I make a mistake, it's gone. And I said, so your entire plan was to build up all this money. And they go, yeah. So the, the problem with just building up the cash is they don't have any belief that they could do it again. And, and then they're done working. And so the universe, this is the the biggest problem. The universe looks at people when they're done, when they say they're retired Mm. and it says, why would you quit when you, when you've got all this wisdom, these decades of wisdom, you're going to opt out of being part of like the, the, the creation space of the, of the world. And the only reason that we think retirement is a good idea is because a hundred years ago we would retire machinery and farm, farm animals. We'd take them out in the back and, and we, we dispose of them because it, they were, we were done. They were, they were no longer useful. We've treated people the same way and mm-hmm. said, you're no longer useful, man. When you're 50, 60 years old, you have decades of wisdom that you can teach other people. And if you say I'm done, I'm just going to lay around, play golf, go to the beach. And that's your entire life. The universe <laughs> is going to say, I'm done with you. And it's going to opt you out of living. It's why most men die within a few years of retiring in the United States, because they're not engaged. They're not stimulated by contribution. That's why I hate retirement so much. I think it's a stupid idea. And I think people need to rethink it. I 
no argument um, <laughs> whatsoever because, uh, a, you know, a little while ago, I, I tried the whole idea of retirement lasted about, you know, three months uh, before I was just going crazy looking for something to do. And I needed to do almost anything other than sit at home and play with, you know, remote controlled helicopters and learn photography, which is kind of what I was doing at the time. So what would you suggest? I mean, with that viewpoint, then what what is quote unquote retirement look like to you today? Well, I, I think retirement, we just need to throw out the idea altogether and say, if we're talking about something in our, in maybe in our 50s, 60s, 70s, really it's, it's finding ways to connect and contribute and there's always a way for us to do that, whether it's our communities or it's our family. There's ways for us to stay engaged. And it's because we're, we care about something and we're bringing our wisdom to the table. And we're not just regurgitating, but we're actually sharing the stories. And that's how we connect with other people. And we're sharing our lessons that we spent a lifetime learning. So to me, that is what we should be striving for, finding ways to contribute. And if you're smart, you're going to find ways to contribute the entire way through. And you're not going to wait till you're 50, 60, 70 years old because you find when you're contributing, you start learning faster and it starts to open you up in a different way, which is why I'm obsessed and in in love with the teaching of the martial arts and the financial literacy, the stuff I do. I can't can't imagine ever retiring, ever stopping this. It seems like the dumbest (laughs) plan ever because it's so much fun. Like, why would I stop? I mean, this is, I, I, I do most of what I do for free. And if that's another thing that we should ask ourselves, what are we willing to do that we do now for free? If somebody wasn't paying us and if there's nothing, there's probably something you should be asking yourself, like, what do I really want to be doing? Because the thing that you really want that drives your heart is probably going to be something that you love so much you wouldn't even care if you were being paid. That's something we need to find, every one of us. Indeed. I I can't agree more. And what's really funny is someone told me the other day, they're like, every time I talk to you, it's like there's a whole new that you have so many lives <laughs> because <Yeah. laughs> there's been so many versions and I'm just like, yeah, I guess so. You know, um, it is what it is. Why, why would anyone choose anything different? So, you know, I, and, and I, I can understand where you're coming from, but what about the, the, the person right now? I mean, understand we, we, there's a lot of unprogramming that has to happen in order for someone to get to the point of, you know what? I'm going to take control, not just the unprogramming, but also the the, the level of confidence to say, you know what, I, I can do a better job uh, th- with this two million, five million, even three hundred thousand dollars, whatever they've got, than you know the Vanguard, the T. Rowe Price, or Charles Schwab, whoever's out there. The the the, the step in the, in the right direction for me is is to borrow the confidence and the experience of other people. And that's not just listening to other people, whether it's podcasts or just being around other people, but it's choosing who's going to influence us. And then consciously, like this is why I love coaching and mentoring, where you consciously go to somebody and you say, I want you to be my experience for a while until I have my own personal experience and you get to leverage off of their belief. I look at people all the time that I'm um, that I'm, I'm working with them one on one or their their customers, clients. And I say, look, I, I see this. It's crystal clear to me. And they I, the moment that they trust that, because I know I'm mm-hmm. right, because I've seen it in the past and it's my special superhero power of X-ray vision into the future. I can I'll, I'll look at them and I say that and they go, OK, and they'll take a step that they wouldn't have taken without it. And I know that that's changing their life. And we can all do that by finding people that we can trust with their experience and trust them before we have our own experience to trust. Yeah, totally understood. And sometimes it's hard to find those people, but here you are. So that's good to know. That's good to know. Now, for those that have listened this far, I'm sure they're curious. They want to know more, maybe how they can take advantage and and, and begin to take some control for, for their own financial future. What's going to be the best way for them to catch up with you, find out what you guys are doing and, and, and just learn more? Best place to, to go and to visit is to remember it's all about total control financial. And that's what the company is. It's, it's totalcontrolfinancial.com. We're, we're giving you control and, and you're going to be able to get a copy of, of the, the book on the QRP. It's one of those tools that, that I wrote and you can get a copy there at totalcontrolfinancial.com. So you can start to dig deeper and see if this is a good fit. And it'll just open your mind to new things that new ways of, of thinking and, and possibly some new paths that you might want to try out and, and it'll start to stir things up. And that's part of the reinvention process. It's part of you breaking free from your past is to stir things up and knock some of that stuff off. 
Indeed, indeed. Now, as we wind down, I'm really interested to hear your answer to this final question because I think it's going to be unique, if nothing else. So um, let's pretend for a moment that someone listening, uh, you know, they're, they're standing in front of the superhero outfit store. They're ready to try this entrepreneur thing out or go bigger, go better, something. And yet, at the same time, they they have... The, their constant companion, and you referred to it earlier. We're going to call it now the voice, and it's that voice that comes up any time we want to be bigger, better, better. We want to go higher. We want to do something different. We think we have, you know, the the better mousetrap, and and it that voice occasionally says things that are less than supportive and tells us what we can't do and reminds us of who we're not and all of these things. And for some people, they're even related to that voice. So, my question to you is as follows. Let's pretend that that person is listening right now, and you know what? They've made a commitment, Damien. They're going to actually follow through, and they're going to do whatever they need to do, and they're going to do it in the next 24 to 48 hours. What would you suggest that they do? I would use something that I came up with a while ago called the blank slate principle, and this this happened after I moved a few times where I kept moving all my all my stuff. I was I'll be light and you know, all my junk kept moving from place to place. And I was like, how many moving trucks am I going to pay for in the next 10 years? And and I started to think, oh, wait a second, if I didn't have any of the stuff in my house, would I necessarily bring it into my house? Um, would I get the same stuff? And, I, and then I asked, OK, if that's if, if I wouldn't bring the stuff in, if I had a brand new house, if I wouldn't go buy all the stuff today, then maybe I should rethink what I'm actually bringing in because it's a kind of a default move. And then it made me think, I think this applies to the rest of my life, the people <laughs> in my life, the the ideas, the beliefs. And I went, okay, well, if I'm going to ta- apply this to my life, then who do I want in my life? And when I started writing that down, it was interesting because there were a number of people that were in my life that didn't weren't on the new list. When I had a blank slate, it was an open canvas. Ooh. The beliefs on on what I saw for my future weren't necessarily the, the stuff I'd been thinking even last week. And if we'll take in the next 24 hours, if we will take a blank slate and and envision our life and and just ig- ignore the stuff from the past, just look into the Ooh. future and imagine, you'll be amazed at how many things from your past are not there. And you can start to understand with that conscious awareness that here's what I need to shift. Here's who needs to depart. Here's what I need to cut. And here's who I'm going to become. Nice and well said. I definitely appreciate, you know, all the wisdom and experience and the knowledge that you've shared with us uh, here today, because w- what it comes down to is that it was hard fought, hard won. And what's really cool is when you can find someone who's willing to to share it. And thank you for doing so here with us today at the Cashflow Diary. Jay, it's been a pleasure. Thanks so much for having me, my friend. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you know what time it is. It's time for you to move at the speed of instruction. What does that mean? That means TotalControlFinancial.com because, well, you want total control, right? You've heard that it's possible to do something that you may not have known was possible. And maybe you've thought about Bitcoin and thought you had no money. Maybe you thought about a restaurant but no cannolis. Maybe you thought that now is the time for you to finally make some moves, and now you know a resource to make that happen. It's been fun talking to you guys today. I look forward to talking to you soon. Until next time.